Bingo! Four o'clock rock. Here we are with our flagship energy show, Hawaii, the state of clean energy, every Wednesday. Be here or be square. <clears throat> That's Mike Sterling at the far end. He's my co-host. He has this amazing capability of sort of synergizing everything, oh, summarizing, making sense out of things. You're so kind. Of and that. here's the guy with the, you know the guys with the raw data. Okay, at my immediate left, Louis Vega. Louis Vega, specialist and manager of the Hawaii National Marine Renewable Energy Center, which is part of HNEI, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. Am I right about that? Okay, we're getting straight. Perfect. Okay, and to his left, Patrick Gross, Cross, oh, cross. that, <laughs> um, program manager, uh, ocean energy, also at Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and he directs the um, military efforts, I guess, at building wave energy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't direct the military, but I, I direct uh, our, the university support to the military efforts. HNEI yes. is where you both are. Yes. You're both specialists there. Yes. And HNEI, if you didn't know, is part of the University of Hawaii. Yes, right? yes. In Manoa, yes. where all good things happen all the time, almost. <laughs> okay, so, Ray, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. what, is, what are we talking about today? Oh, well, we're, I think we're going to be talking about the energy that uh, is trapped in the ocean right now and uh, that uh, if we can get it out of the ocean, that would help us uh, with our renewable energy efforts. And yeah. I understand, I, I was reading a, a blog, uh, Dr. Jeff Ma Masters, who is part of uh, the Weather Underground, uh, wrote an article yesterday that uh, basically talked about June being the the hottest uh, month uh, yet, and it, worldwide. Uh, it worldwide, and uh, he uh, had a blog that, that really summarized what's been happening in the ocean. So the ocean is very, very hot now, and that's energy, and energy can either come at us in the form of a hurricane, or perhaps if we can learn how to tap it, as these gentlemen have been working on. Uh, we can we can actually suck some of that energy out and use it as clean energy for uh, our electric supply. Well, there's a lot of energy out there. We've been thinking about this a long time. Uh, Louis has been working on it since 1922. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know about Patrick. Maybe the same. Yeah. 28. 28. Okay. And it's out there, and we are not really capturing it right now. We have not really captured it. So we ought to just talk about today, you know, how much is it really unlimited? If I, if I put paddle wheels across every ocean, would I slow the ocean process down? Could I take too much energy from the ocean? Would it, would it affect our environment if I did that? And what kinds of ways can we use to get it out of there and use it? And how expensive is it or cheap? You go first, please. Well, for the purposes of today, I will talk about ocean thermal and my partner and friend, Pat, will talk about wave energy. So regarding ocean thermal, what is really important to understand is that um, unlike uh, intermittent resources like solar, wind, and waves, after all, they all come from the sun indirectly, uh, the beauty of, of ocean thermal is that it's always there. So it's what we can call as engineers base load. And it's also dispatchable, and that's really important. So to me, that should be a, one of the ingredients that will lead us towards our ambitious goal of having by 2045, 100%. Is it unlimited? Is, is it we could, the humanity could live on limit, this forever and ever? The, the only way we can answer that is to tell you that uh, because we're not really doing any, any more advances right now due to funding, what we have been able to do at the university with Professor Niehaus, um, sorry, should be, in French it's called Niehaus, but he goes by Niehaus because that's the way we pronounce it in English, I guess. Uh, is that uh, we set up with a, uh, he set up with our funding with, with uh, a computer model such that we took uh, the area that is considered to be the, the area with the, with the uh, most appropriate ocean thermal resource for ocean thermal energy conversion, basically between, roughly speaking, between 20 degrees south and 20 degrees north latitude around the equator. And we theoretically put 100 megawatt plant each and we divided that area into 23 by 23 kilometers uh, so that they, the plants will not interfere with one another. Mm. And in doing that, you're able to generate um, close to 90% of the energy, all the energy consumed in the world. Oh, so you ask yourself, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. You ask yourself the next question, though, and of course that would change the 
um, distribution of, of, of temperature in the oceans. So you begin to ask yourself, how much of that can you take? Some areas will get colder, some areas will get warmer. Uh, but when we do that with a computer, we can snap our finger and instantaneously have 250,000 plants. But we have zero plants right now. So that's, that's just saying how far could we get. Yeah. And perhaps without worrying about exact numbers, I can tell you for, uh, not everybody knows what that is, but uh, it's basically close to 90% of what we consume right now. Yeah. Um, it appears that we will not really affect the oceans uh, in a really okay. detrimental way. Now, now, ocean thermal, I mean, it's fascinating. Ocean thermal was a big thing in Kona back in the 70s. It still 70s. Is, it still there was a is, ship yeah. out there, a big red ship with OTEC written on the side, mm -hmm. and it was this uh, deep pipe that uh, originally Nelha built that, the National Energy Laboratory of Hawaii in uh, Kona there, um, in order to uh, get that cold water from way down deep. And as I understand, there's a difference between the temperature of the cold right. water and the surface warm water. Right. So you, if you have a shelf that goes straight down, yeah. you, you know, uh, and as close to shore, you can take advantage of that and, and get a better result. However, the other thing is um, it's expensive because the, the metals involved in ocean, ocean thermal, ordinary metals corrode. The old problem of ocean energy, corrosion of metals, um, and if the metals corrode, you've got to replace them all the time. Okay. So the one that was most likely candidate, my recollection, and this is 10 years ago anyway, uh, is right. titanium. Right. Titanium is very expensive. Right. Yeah? So right. is this the problem? No, not really. The, the, the problem is, is that uh, uh, we did all the work that we could do with experimental plants. The biggest plant ever operated and constructed and operated was at, at, at Nelha. By the way, it's national, it's natural. National, they're not part of the national system, uh, but it doesn't matter, it's NELHA. Um, um, it was 250 kilowatt, or, or 0 0.25 megawatt. And we're talking about plants that would be 100 megawatt. That's 400 times bigger. So to jump from that experimental plant- There are issues. They're, they're, no, there's, they have to take steps in between. Yeah. But those steps require government funding. And that's where the challenge begin for us because out of the 50 states, as a state, we're the only one that can use OTEC directly. So we try to tell people from all the states, you could manufacture the equipment and then benefit in that way. For yeah. example, our friends in Japan and in Korea are trying to develop OTEC to provide the equipment because they don't have the resource like we do. Uh, so that's, that's really important to, to understand. But going back to materials, I mean, that wasn't in the Navy, I wasn't in the Navy. <laughs> we have problems with, uh, with corrosion but, but it's a matter of maintenance and, and to know what is the life cycle. And for example, uh, our friends from Macau Ocean Engineering are now uh, with some of our They had the team. facility at, at Nelha, right? Right now, yeah, yes. The big uh, tower. Would, yeah, 100 kilowatt. But the plant, tower yeah. ultimately has to go in the water. Yeah, this is just to experiment with heat exchangers. That's what you were referring to. The, the, the most effective one in, uh, are, are the titanium, but as you said, they're expensive. But what has been done and is currently being done there is to identify aluminum alloys that can give you the 30 year life expectancy. And they have identified alloys that could do that. But part of the issue is trying to get manufacturing companies to manufacture these devices. They need to know what is the market. How many are you going to buy? That's one of the problems with OTEC is, that is relatively speaking, large components. And how do you get manufacturers? So what has to happen to make this you know, rea reality? In a way, it's like taking a, a time machine, if you could, and, and go back to the 70s and ask yourself, how was it that wind energy was developed to the point that it's now commercial? And in many areas, it's really competitive. And the answer to me is, thank the citizens of Germany and the citizens of Denmark, because they pay for it. The, their governments sponsor all the research, all the uh, trials and errors, but that has changed. That economic model doesn't exist in the world anymore. No government would ever fund things that way anymore. It's just really hard to do. What, what has happened? People lost the thrill of uh, No, I think what happened energy? is that we are also in love with the idea of a quick payback. That for something like OTEC, for example, you need to build a demonstration plan or pre-commercial plan. That is, it would take you three or four years before you begin to operate it. And then with that information, operate it for a couple of years, you begin to build the first commercial plan. Yeah. So you're an investor that you're willing to wait seven to 10 years, and the answer is no. Last question before we take yeah. a break, and that is, <clears throat> If we are able to build this, if the government steps up and people, the energy industry, the utilities, everybody steps up and say, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cooperate, we'll give permits, yeah. um, you know, we'll fund it, we'll buy the resulting energy or 
develop storage facilities to keep it and transport it as necessary. If we do all of that, is do you think, I mean, what's, what's the idea about profitability, I mean, about cost, rather, the price? Yeah, yeah, is this going to be cheaper than geothermal, more expensive, cheaper than, oh, I don't know, cheaper than wind, uh, cheaper than solar, more expensive, what? Well, the, the, the answer is that we, when, when, if you want to know about solar or wind, I can go and get three or four quotes from three or four different vendors right now. But to talk about ocean thermal energy being converted to electricity, we're not there yet. So I can tell you what we have done with economic analysis and what is type of analysis. And, and when I do that, I'd like you to also understand the following. When you look at the petroleum resources that we have, for example, uh, for liquid fuels, we have maybe 50 years left in the world. Uh, coal, we have 100 years. You mean petroleum? Yes. Yeah. Coal, we have 100 years. Um, natural gas, we have maybe 120 years. And when you think about how long Do it took... people know this? Do you know they, they, this? They should this know that, serious. really. This is like to climate me, change. To me, it's really serious we're, we're because... In a, we're in a time bomb. To me, that, that's perhaps... At this point, for the, today's discussion, is more important than climate change in a world. They're related because yeah. what is going to happen to Hawaii 34 years from now? How are we going to get to 100% renewable energy to produce electricity? I have a hard time believing we can do that without ocean thermal because ocean thermal is based low and is dispatchable. I, I'm, I have solar panels in my house. I have worked in wind for many years. I did rural electrification with those, those components. Uh, but you need to store the energy so I can use it in the evenings when I get home, right? Right now in my house, and also Patrick's house, we have this beauty called, a battery called the uh, HECO. I mean, HECO is my battery. Mm -hmm. I am making electricity right now while I'm talking to you. When I go home tonight, I'm going to turn on my, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get my cold beer and turn on my television. Nice to have HECO working for you. HECO's working for me. <laughs> you know, they, they, they have a beautiful battery. People forget that. When people get an hour saying we're going to get to 100% renewable for electricity production with wind and solar, I'm asking how are you going to store the energy? People don't want to talk about that. Yeah. And also when we talk about things being cost effective, it's because we have subsidies. Coal has subsidies, uh, petroleum fuel has subsidies, everybody has but subsidies. But not OTEC. No, no, not, not, not yet. <laughs> what a shame. Yeah. Okay, on that note, I feel sad. You, Ray, do you feel sad too? Do you feel sad enough to take a break? Let's <laughs> take a break. Yes, <laughs> Feeling do. sad. Then we'll talk about wave energy. Then we'll come back yeah. and talk about wave energy. You'll be on the spot, Patrick. Okay. That's Patrick. He's going to be on the spot. We'll be right back. You're watching ThinkTech Hawaii, meeting people we may have not otherwise met helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on ThinkTech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm fortunate to be able to host Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join in with us every Tuesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. to see the interesting people we have to share with you their information. Aloha. Okay, I've been waiting all this time to hear from Patrick. We're going to hear from him now. Okay, Wave Action Energy is your bag. Tell us how it's doing. Well, actually, uh, Luis and I are both intimately involved in our efforts in Wave Energy, uh, and specifically what we're doing in Hawaii at, at the university and at HNEI is, is supporting the Navy's test site. So it's the only Wave Energy test site in the country. It's one of only a few in the whole world. Um, so... At Kaneohe Bay? At Ka yes, off, off the Marine Corps base, right off the runway at the Marine Corps base. So uh, that's where the site is. It's three berths. Uh, there are two of them that are occupied with wave energy devices produced by commercial entities. Uh, they're pre-commercial, we would call them experimental devices. Um, wave energy, unlike OTEC, has a long way to go in terms of engineering. Uh, there are many... Does that mean metals? It, it means metals, it means survivability at sea, corrosion, yes, uh, just mechanical failure, uh, serviceability when things break, mm. uh, hydraulics or, or direct drive systems. It's just having something out in the ocean that's designed to move around 
and, and do so for a long periods of time and not break. And if it does break, being able to efficiently service it. And that, so wave energy devices at this point in time have many, many different looks, com radically different approaches to how to extract the energy from the sea. Uh, so it's, while OTEC is, a, is largely a solved problem engineering wise mm -hmm. and, and faces mm -hmm. budgetary and permitting challenges, uh, wave energy faces those too, but it, it's also got a long way to go in terms of solving the engineering challenges, which is why it's fun to be involved in the, in the test site from our perspective. Uh, we get to see these technologies come in and, and hope for the best in terms of how well they work and uh, collect the data and observe the envi environmental impacts and hopefully move the industry along. So uh, I guess one thing you didn't mention is the transmission of the energy through a power cable of some kind. Is that also a challenge? Because, you know, it's moving. The thing is moving. I mean, even if it doesn't move much, it still moves. And that cable is going to have to deal with that movement, right? Oh, that's part. I mean, the whole system, the, the mooring systems, yeah. the, uh, the connection points to the cables. Yes, I, the, the ocean is a dynamic environment and things move around. So there, there are, I think, some pretty reliable approaches these days to addressing that particular problem. And, and, and so far, so good with the cabling at, at our test site. And, and at other test sites. Uh, that hasn't been a, as big an issue as, as some others. You remember, I mean, I remember, um, you know, they used to have the thing called the snake. Pelamis. Pelamis, yes. What was it? It's called Pelamis. Is that it's, a, it's a Greek name for a snake. Greek name for yeah. snake, yeah. yeah. No, this might, I, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, and they had all kinds of, you know, weird Rube Goldberg kinds of contraptions that somehow, uh, you know, held together even in the face of all that, all that energy at sea, the movement at sea. Um, but you, you really wondered whether they could do this in a way that would be sustainable, that, that where the machine would continue. So what is the favored technique right now? What is out there as the leading possibility? That, well, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and I don't think we're ready to answer it yet. Um, you know, uh, yes, the Palamis uh, was, a, was a great example. They were one of the pioneers, really, in the field. And theoretically, uh, in terms of how energy is extracted from different uh, movements of the ocean, uh, that it's a great device. But its, its problem was that it just couldn't survive. It just kept breaking. So, uh, in fact, that company is now, they've, they've made a lot of advances, but they don't exist anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And same is true of a couple other pioneers in the field, uh, such as Aquamarine, also a Scottish company that had a different approach, uh, near shore with a, just a big flop device uh, in the near shore. Uh, and that company has, has gone away. Uh, so I those are two company, radically different approaches. An Australian approaches. company yes. had this big affair north of Maui, was it? Well, it was going to be there. It was going to be. Yeah. What, whatever happened to that? Ocean links, they also Ocean links, yeah. are no longer in existence. So I, I a pattern get a, here. Yeah. I get a, a I kind of a really a picture on had, this. Had, uh, their, their model that they were going to bring up here, they had a storm that uh, in, down in oh, Australia, Australia that, in Australia. that yeah. uh, tore it up, and, uh, and they just didn't have the funding to come back with it. Yeah. That was an os um, oscillating water column. Calm, yes, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I get a, I mean, I get a, a bleak picture from this. Um, you know, is this really going to go anywhere? I mean, we have a lot of fish to fry here. We have other renewables um, that have, uh, you know, actually gone into production. I mean, solar, for example. And, sure. Uh, uh, so why, why should we spend time on this one? Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. Maybe in a, you know, a generation or two when, when material science uh, gets more sophisticated, who knows, maybe nanotech will develop a, a material that will, you know, that will survive. But right now, why should we do it? Well, I, yeah, Luis may have a, a different twist, but I, I guess I'm shifting from the, the negatives of, the, of some of these company failures and technologies that have been good ideas but haven't worked. There's some new, the, there's some new ideas coming down the pipe. There's, a, there's an oscillating water column that's not unlike the Ocean Links approach that will be tested starting next year at WETS from an Irish company called Ocean Energy. Uh, there's great optimism for that particular device. It's, uh, it's of a significantly larger scale in terms of power production and size, 
from these first two experimental devices. So there's still, there's still a lot of good ideas coming down the pipeline. Um, and why, yeah, it's a difficult problem, obviously, a very difficult problem. And so that's the obvious question. Why bother in the face of solar and, and PV, or PV and wind, when the, which are much more mature uh, and much more commercially viable today? Uh, and I think the answer is we need we need the mix. We need the the whole mix to to get to the to the end. And the 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 theoretical and even the practical resource in wave is is vast. It's it really could well in, a, in an ideal way. I mean, suppose you solve the material science questions and the stability and connection and um, you know all the all the technical questions. Suppose you solve them all. What role could wave energy play in lighting Oahu? Where would they be? How far out to sea would they be? How would you protect them against the shipping lanes and protect the shipping lanes against collision with them? Um, uh, what role would they play? Would they be? And again, my question that I put to Louise earlier: Are they more expensive, less expensive? Do you see them as being cheaper and therefore more attractive? I would. I, well, at this point, again, that's hard to answer. It's, it's hard to answer some of your questions, but uh, Sorry, because it, we're just so early in no, the in the in the game with wave energy, and right now, wave energy is is about as expensive as as anything out there. But the potential is there to gain the efficiencies and and produce things in in quantity and and and, and become somewhat competitive. What with I get other out forms. of this is that if you have a device and you put it out, so, such as that one uh, from Australia. Um, uh, that it, it would, and assuming it was not going to rust and corrode and all that and break, um, it's just out there and it's generating power for a long, long time. Um, and assuming there's not a lot of maintenance at very cheap, you know, cost, it's just out there functioning, sending power back. That's a pretty good deal. That's the dream. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. we're working yeah, toward. If yeah. I might yeah. ask something, Pastor, is that in, in a way, Jay, I mean, I've been unfair because uh, you want us to to answer your questions. Imagine we were in the wind energy, and, but this is 1978, 1980. <laughs> That's where we are with waves. And you want us to be in 2016 already. And remember once more that wind energy was developed because the Danes and the Germans. And when those companies were trying to develop and they had a lot of trial and errors, they kept getting funding from the government because they were making advancements. And as we speak, they're making this blaze with a diameter of 180 meters. That's almost two city blocks in diameter. And those things are being deployed in the ocean and they're being connected to land by submarine power cables. So, but, and they all look the same pretty much from the outside. Uh, it's like sometimes you look at a car and I cannot tell the difference between a Toyota or a Honda or a whatever. To me, they all look the same basically, because I'm not into cars, I guess. But, but, <laughs> but uh, it's the same with the wind. They all look the same from far away in the business. Or you see the big logo. Yeah. Uh, they all have three blades. They all forward-looking and so on and so forth. They're horizontal and uh, so, but took a while to get there. I can show you some films even, some old films of, of early pioneers with wind devices. Well, I remember being, they broke. Yeah. There were many wind farms in this state yes, that, yes, that yes. fell apart and were abandoned. That was the problem. So when the guys that I'm talking about already retired from HECO, but when I moved to Hawaii 30 years ago, some of the HECO engineers wouldn't talk about renewable energy because they were the ones that fresh out of college had to work with the wind then, <laughs> and they lost a lot of nights of sleep. <laughs> and, and now wind is completely commercial, completely available. It's still not accepted. <laughs> we well, yeah, has to do a, a lab with just people don't want things in the, back, <coughs> in the backyard, I guess. Is the what idea. about acceptance? I mean, if I, if I put wind out there, let's say off the uh, leeward coast of uh, Oahu, I know I'll get some protest. But this is already uh, happening. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's a great idea, and it's all over Europe. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, all over the North Sea. I mean, wind, lots of wind, and it's very effective. Um, but we would have protest. Query, would we have protest, you think, uh, in the case of wave energy devices out there? Uh, or, for that matter, in the case of OTEC devices out there? I would say for Hawaii, uh, we do have a good wave resource here. Um, so there's there's reasons economically to, to consider wave for Hawaii, but it, we would not be immune from the same sorts of uh, <laughs> objections with wave energy. For the most part, they would be low profile devices, so they'd be a little bit less visually uh, troublesome. Uh, 
um, but no doubt, you know, fishermen would would argue, and uh, we we think. You know, I tend to think it's a it's a low impact approach to energy extraction as compared to the big wind turbines offshore, but uh, it it would be challenging. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's why we have to go back to to the the, the, the fact because it is a fact that we have. Um, limit the resources from fossil fuels, and that's what we depend on Hawaii, for example, and a lot of countries, even the Chinese are using a lot of coal right now, that they're going to run out in 50 to 120 years, depending on what is, what is the source, and, uh, and what are we going to do? We have to, it took 30 years to implement wind, and it's going to take that long to implement waves, for example. Yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> what do you make of this, Ray? Uh, where does this fit in the array of possibilities? Well, I, I think we don't have a choice. I think we have to move forward, and uh, hopefully the government will continue to fund this and perhaps even put more money into it uh, because it's very expensive to get something like this going. But we need it. There's lots of energy in the ocean. We need to extract it, and we need to do something to um, dampen down the, uh, the climate uh, change that uh, we're suffering because of the fossil fuel. So I think even if we, um, even if we don't uh, have to worry about that, uh, it, we're going to eventually run out of fossil fuel. So we need to do something to get off of the extreme uh, uh, connection with, with fossil fuel and the need to, uh, to have that. So I don't think we have a choice. And these guys are doing a good job with what they've got, but uh, I think we need to do more in the uh, help with the finances uh, from the government on this. And I, and I think that will probably happen because I think the climate change will drive it more now than anything else. Yeah, that's what will happen. I agree, Ray. That's what will happen. We'll have a bad storm. Uh, we'll see more clearly how we're on a one-way street here. And uh, we will agree with you, Louise, that you've got to have everything. Mm -hmm. And Patrick, you've got to have everything. It's, it's the diversity that we need because uh, most of the renewable energy is, is not uh, consistent, except for the, the um, OTAC, um, but most of the other energy. Uh, you're going to have to have a diversity. So when the wind's not blowing, maybe the waves are going and, and exactly, so forth, yeah. um, or the sun's shining or whatever. Right. So that's where we, we can't, we've got to continue. We've got to move forward. Yeah, and we can't be cheap about it. We've got to spend the money because the alternative is not to have these sort of resources, and that would, that's not acceptable at all. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I hope the delegation is listening, and I hope they do some funding for you. Thanks to you. <laughs> this is Think Tech. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, uh, where um, Ray and I, Ray Starling and I, have talked with the specialists at uh, the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, Luis Vega and Patrick Gross, Cross, looking at, uh, you know, what's going on in the ocean. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks to you.